very good evening and good morning to Sufi, Suhini and Nell. I would like to give a brief introduction about both the co-editors and then we can go forward with your book discussion for like 40 minutes followed by Q&A for next 15 to 20 minutes. Okay. Uh, first, uh, Dr. Sohini Sara Pillai, she is an assistant professor of religion at Kalamazoo College. She is a comparatist of South Asian religious literature and her area of specialization is the Mahabharata and Ramayana epic narrative traditions with a particular focus on retelling created in Hindi and Tamil. Uh, she received her PhD in South and Southeast Asian studies from the University of California, Berkeley her MA in Middle Eastern and South Asian Studies and African Studies from Columbia University, and her BA in South Asian Studies and Theater Studies from uh, Wesley College. A very warm welcome to you, Dr. Sohini. We are looking forward to this discussion. Thank you. And, and we have another co-editor, interestingly, Nell Sapir Haule. I am very, you know, I, I just very fascinated with the name. Uh, she is a preceptor in Sanskrit at Harvard University. She is a doctoral candidate in South Asian languages and civilizations at the University of Chicago. Her dissertation is titled The War That Wasn't, uh, the Virata Parna, the uh, Pankartatra, I mean, these are the Sanskrit name I can assume, and the fantasy <laughs> life of the Mahabharata. She designed and taught the undergraduate course, Yoga, Text, Practices, Politics, and taught elementary and intermediate Sanskrit. Sorry for my wrong pronunciation about the Sanskrit word, because I have no idea about it. Yeah. And a very warm welcome to you, Nell. And we are looking forward to your wonderful book dis uh, discussion. Thank Great. you. Yeah. Um, first, we just like uh, to thank everyone at the Center for Studies of Pro Societies, especially Azima and Sheba for helping to organize all of this. We're so honored honored that we're able to join all of you today um, and that we can tell you a little bit about um, this project, this um, volume, Many Mahabharatas, uh, which Nell and I started working on together. So I'll begin with the quote that we begin the book with, which is this from um, Nanaya's 11th century Mahabharatamu um, in Telugu. And, um, and Nanaya writes, those who hear Mahabharata in many languages, in many styles, from many tellers, always wanting these stories, all the rewards of many offerings will forever be theirs. So that's our sort of Mangala shloka for, um, for, for the book and, and hopefully for this talk as well. So as soon as you begin to ask questions about what the Mahabharata is, does, and says, you find yourself staring at some of the most daunting and irresistible challenges in the study of South Asian literature and religion. And as you all know, when it comes to the Sanskrit Mahabharata, the original epic account, we're gonna put that original in some serious quotation marks, but that's all right, the original um, epic account, there's a certain darkness with which we must contend. The protagonist's family splinters, the characters hurl accusations of moral failing at one another in the sort of infinite regress, the main figures die vividly and poignantly, um, and everything is subject to deconstruction, dilemma, and decay. And so it is sometimes considered inauspicious to read the entire text or to keep it inside one's house. Yet, even the epic's own sinister power cannot contain it. Triumphalist readings of the Mahabharata have made it India's national epic. Another, um, another title that we might question, but some believe that that's true. Um, the Bhagavad Gita, uh, as, we, as we know, constitutes a sacrosanct strand of many Hindu worldviews. But the clearest indicator of the epic's allure is the fact that uh, for the last 2000 years, the most common response to the Mahabharata has been to recreate it. From medieval Telugu poetry to transnational Twitter, Mahabharatas flood the languages, localities, and literary genres of South Asia and beyond. How is it then that a story so disquieting has also proven so attractive? Each of the 18 chapters in this book presents its own answers to it presents its own answer to that question. And here's ours. The Mahabharata story inherently invites more Mahabharatas. Because of the relentless complexity of its worldview and the ensuing magnitude of its scope, the Mahabharata persists in leaving its interpreters more to tease out, more to experience, more to complicate or to resolve. After all, as belief has it, there is something dangerous about a complete Mahabharata, and so there are many of them. One is never enough. 
There are Mahabharatas in Upper Pramsha, Arabic, Assamese, uh, Bengali, Gujarati, Hindi, Kannada, Konkani, Malayalam, Marathi, Nepali, Oriya, Persian, Prakrit, Punjabi, Sanskrit, Sindhi, Tamil, Telugu, Urdu, and countless other South Asian languages. I'm sure those of you in the audience can uh, name a few more that we missed. Um, and, and all of these Mahabharatas testify to the fact that when it comes to this story, there will always be more to say, and there will always be more ways to say it. The many Mahabharatas that emerge from the Indian subcontinent include poems, plays, sculptures, paintings, novels, folk tales, short stories, comic books, essays, television shows, and films. This desire for more, always wanting these stories, in the words um, of this uh, passage from Nanaya's 11th century Telugu Mahabharatamu that I quoted earlier, always wanting these stories, this desire for more, is baked into the Sanskrit Mahabharata's own creation myth, of which I have a picture, sort of. <laughs> um, all right. And there in this creation myth, um, Ganesha, the elephant headed deity, of course, here he is, um, and the text's divine scribe, uh, demands that the sage Vyasa, who is the text's mythical author and also the grandfather of um, many of the story's main figures, um, dictate the Mahabharata him, the Mahabharata to him without interruption, so that Ganesha will not have to stop writing, like even for a moment. Um, and Ganesha, a sort of archetypical, always wanting these stories person or figure, um, becomes not only the Mahabharata's like original hungry audience, but also its original reteller, its transmitter from one medium to another. Already the myth links the desire for more of the Mahabharata with the act of retelling it. And Ganesha never finds satisfaction. Vyasa um, makes a counteroffer because in the world of this Mahabharata, sort of everything is up for negotiation. Um, and he demands that Ganesha actually comprehend each passage before writing it down. And when Ganesha seems to be getting ahead of the dictation, um, Vyasa will interrupt the flow of the narration with an especially complicated passage. So this call for perpetual interpretation basically that, that Ganesha make meaning out of each verse would seem to be disruptive enough. But there's also the literary strategy of rupture per se, a sort of gap of meaning in the narrative, a moment in the Mahabharata story when a, when a palpable presence of absence um, disorients the, the listener from her emotional and intellectual expectations. And the two outermost frame stories of the Sanskrit epic employ this idea of rupture, this sort of idea of interruption um, in a more literal way. And in both frame stories in the Sanskrit epic, the narration of the Mahabharata takes place during the pauses in an ongoing ritual. So now we're not in the sort of story of the creation myth that we have this slide of, but we're in the, the frame story of the Sanskrit epic itself. Um, and so in those frame stories, the Mahabharata interrupts the ritual and the ritual interrupts the Mahabharata. And so all of these meta narratives this um, creation myth, and then also these frame stories teach us that an essential part of reading or hearing, as the case may be, the Mahabharata, is never getting quite enough of it, at least not as soon as one wants it. The story remains interrupted, incomplete, maybe a little incomprehensible. That the epic claims to include whatever exists, I think I have a slide for this. There we go. That the epic claims to include whatever exists, um, which in Sanskrit we have this famous verse um, from book books one and book eight and book eighteen of the epic. Um, Dharme charte cha kame cha mukshe cha bharatar shabha yadi hasti tadan yatra yadne hasti natat kachit. So when it comes to dharma, artha, kama, and moksha, what is here is elsewhere but what is not here is not anywhere else. So there is this like grand claim to include whatever exists that's encapsulated in this verse. And yet at the same time, the epic runs on this sort of fuel of unfinished, unstable, unsatisfied things, stories, rituals, lineages, truths, audiences. That incongruity is one of the sort of tantalizing incongruities that propels the Mahabharata forward into endless tellings. What's more, the chapters in this book demonstrate that any Mahabharata represents many Mahabharatas. So we have retellings inside retellings. Four chapters of the book explore Mahabharatas that reconstruct the events of the Virata Parvan, which is the fourth book of the epic. Um, 
uh, and we might translate Virata Parvin as like the book of Virata's court. Um, and this is a book of the Sanskrit Mahabharata that self-consciously mirrors the epic as a whole. Um, so a lot of chapters in the book focus on like this particular part of the book that is actually itself a retelling of the entire epic. Um, and then other authors in our, in, our, um, in our volume found it sort of impossible to stop at one Mahabharata, even though they knew that the volume would address over a dozen more. Um, so there are a lot of chapters that don't just talk about one Mahabharata, but that themselves talk about like multiple tellings. Um, and what this means really is that the process of organizing this book has taught us that when it comes to understanding the Mahabharata, Comparison, which drives every chapter in one way or another, becomes a particularly fruitful tool for interpretation. And clearly a comparative approach complements the multivocality that many Mahabharatas embody. Mahabharatas often unfold through multiple narrative voices that diverge from and question one another. This intrinsic multivocality allows Mahabharatas to mirror on a formal level the various conflicts that they depict in terms of their content. So even, even Mahabharatas that present the narrative in a more um, ethically or aesthetically straightforward manner, as some of the works in our volume do, are in some sense responding to this multivocal or interrogative mode of storytelling. Finally, I'll say that there are no categorical boundaries that the Mahabharata does not overstep. The chapters in our book show that the Mahabharata has been both elite and popular, Hindu and not Hindu, classical and vernacular, orthodox and heterodox, constructive and destructive, textual and performative, fragmented and whole, normative and subversive, and affirmative and surprising. For some of the interpretive communities featured in this book, the Mahabharata defines these categories. And for others, the Mahabharata dismantles these terms of analysis entirely. So to anyone who is, insists that the Mahabharata is one thing or another, we present the astounding magnitude and heterogeneity of this literary cosmos. If there is a Mahabharata, it's a trans-historical, trans-linguistic, and transmedial thing. It's a Mahabharata that insists on engendering more Mahabharatas. So here we have a picture of the um, the figures traditionally conceived as the heroes of the Mahabharata, the Pandavas and their shared wife Draupadi, right? And so we first conceived of this book as one answer among many, of course, to the enduring question of what just the Mahabharata does, um, what it is and what it says. And there will be many answers to this mega question and many of them will presume again, more and many Mahabharatas. Even the title Mahabharata, suggesting a unified body of a text, right, hides a plural behind its ever so gossamer veil. Mahabharata, after all, means the great Bharatas, right, plural. Still, one might ask, is there not a single core story of these great Bharatas? And a great thing about having our primary audience for this talk be in India means that we don't need to give you a detailed plot synopsis of the core Mahabharata story. Um, but, right, so here we have um, one of my favorite um, kind of political cartoons um, by a great artist who's on Twitter and Instagram called Pen Pencil Draw um, of the 100 Kauravas um, in their infancy, right? Um, but so, but does a composition need to tell the story of the apocalyptic war between the Pandavas and the Kauravas who we see on our screen in order to be considered a Mahabharata? So consider, for example, the Jain narratives that interrogate the story of the Pandavas into their more sweeping accounts of the lives of Krishna and his cousin Neminatha, who is the 22nd Tirthankara or Jain teacher, right? And so we know that the Jain religious tradition is one that is based on um, these principles of asceticism and um, often nonviolence, right? So when we consider um, the earliest of these texts, Janasena Punata's eighth century Sanskrit Haribamsha Purana, after the Kauravas are defeated, but not killed, again, this is a Jain narrative by the Pandavas in the Great War, the Hundred Brothers renounce all of their earthly possessions and become ascetics, right? So this is a story that doesn't end with 1.6 billion people dead after the Great War. 
Two remarkably similar poems, Bhim Kavi's 15th century Hindi, Dangvei Katha, and Cherigonda Dharmana's 16th century Telaga Chitra Bharat Damu, depict the Pandavas and the Kauravas joining forces to wage battle with Krishna, right, in order to save the life of a local king. Uh, the Sanskrit drama Pancharatra, um, composed sometime between 200 and 800 CE, attributed to um, the great poet Vasa, um, a, a play that Nell works very closely with in her own research, is still more radical in its departure from the central storyline. Because in this play, the feuding cousins avoid the war at Kurukshetra at all. They're not even, they don't, they're not fighting with each other against Krishna. They're just, they're not fighting. Yeah, so, they split the kingdom and live happily ever after. Yeah, so the violence <laughs> is completely gone, right? Still, other works ignore all but one or two characters. So Karna, for example, we see on our screen with his mother um, Kunti, or Ashvataman, the son of Drona, uh, Gatotkacha, one of my favorite characters from the Mahabharata, the son of Bhima and Hidimba, uh, the Rakshasi or demoness, right? And so these other, there are many works that focus on these characters and engage more self-contained installments from the Mahabharata narrative corpus. So we also have, you know, the stories of Shakuntala, Savitri, or Nala and Damayanti. Um, the Pandavas and Kauravas don't really show up in these stories. These are these kind of upakyanas or side stories in the Mahabharata. Do we consider these retellings or stories Mahabharatas as well, right? So are these compositions, so many of which refrain from calling them themselves anything resembling the word Mahabharata, are they in fact Mahabharatas? Sometimes being a Mahabharata means that a work shares certain motifs, characters, structures, relationships, themes with the story um, that we all know about the Pandavas and the Kauravas, and a story which all the audiences we consider in this book would have been or are intimately familiar with. Perhaps we can be content with the idea that sometimes being a Mahabharata means being a work that relates to the central core story or to other Mahabharatas that embody it. But there are many different ways in which this can be done. To follow in A.K. Ramunajan's deeply imprinted footsteps, we might delineate these relationships as responsive, reflexive, or self-reflexive. Or again, following Ramunajan, we might call them iconic, indexical, or symbolic. In the end, we would propose the novels, plays, poems, essays, chronicles, and short stories studied in this book become more meaningful when we leave aside these formal constraints and experiences that make them first and foremost as Mahabharatas. That is, when we embed them in the ever-growing ecosystem of Mahabharata-related works. The important thing isn't whether a composition is a Mahabharata or calls itself one, but whether the value of interpreting that work um, increases as a result of putting it into conversation with other Mahabharatas. We would argue that it is all that it almost always does, and often with a sense of discovery that feels like a crystallization. Wendy Doniger uses the concept of conversation to describe the value of reading intertextually whether it involves a conscious quotation or a more unconscious kind of representation, she writes the idea of intertextuality enables us to eavesdrop on the conversation between storytellers centuries and continents apart. How we listen to this conversation also matters. Ramunajan speaks of a genre as a special way of listening, one that requires hearing radially, so as to take in other works, even when listening to one in particular. Here is how he describes classical thumber poems. Every poem resonates with the absent presence of others that sound with it, like the unstruck strings of a sitar. So we respond to a system of presences and absences. Our reading then is not linear, but what has been called radial. Each poem is part of a larger self-reflective paradigm. It relates to all others in absentia, gathers ironies, illusions. One text becomes the context of others. Each is precisely foregrounded against a background of all the others. In the spirit of Ramanujan's model above, we propose to read the Mahabharata tradition as if it constituted a genre of its own. And Ramanujan himself um, said something similar of the Ramayana tradition, um, that it's not merely an in set of individual texts, but a genre with a variety of instances. Mahabharatas shape a system of presences and absences based on recurring characters, relationships, stories, themes, and aesthetics. 
When we experience a Mahabharata, we respond, whether we are aware of it or not, to the presence, absence, inversion, subversion, or reformation of these shared features that frame our own expectations. Engaging with the Mahabharata as a genre would prompt us to listen for such resonances across languages, regions, religions, cultures, and all kinds of historical contexts. The broader goal of many Mahabharatas then is to facilitate this kind of listening. By representing the Mahabharata as transmedial, transhistorical, translinguistic, and transdisciplinary mode of expression in South Asia, this book, um, does, we hope, um, enable the reader to listen closely to a given interpretation of the Mahabharata while hearing a polyphony of absent tellings in the background. The sections of this volume, here, I'll just go back to our thing. Okay, soon, soon to get to the forward. So the sections of this volume um, reflect a roughly chronological progression of Mahabharata representations that appear across this range of South Asian literary, religious, historical, social, and political contexts. Of course, we cannot include reflections on every Mahabharata. <laughs> um, such a book would end up being longer than the Sanskrit Mahabharata itself, and I don't want to think about how long this book talk would be. Um, so, in order to um, in order to keep the length of the book in check, um, and to and to escape the long-standing curse that is said to befall those who take on the epic as a whole, um, we explore but a tiny fraction of extant Mahabharatas. For one thing, um, we restrict the scope of our primary sources to Mahabharatas of South Asian origin. As we know, there are Mahabharatas that, that are made outside of South Asia, especially in this day and age, but, um, but we focus just on South Asia. Um, also, uh, we tended to prioritize less accessible Mahabharatas. Um, so these would be works that a reader might seek help um, understanding or appreciating if she happened to come across them on her own or simply to hear of their existence. Um, and so for this reason, the volume contains a significant number of essays on pre-modern Mahabharatas in less commonly known languages, Apabramsha, Old Kannada, even Sanskrit, um, and, and a few others. And, and many of the works that we talk about in the book have, have not been translated into English. So within these bounds, we've also endeavored to make our collection of sources representative of different languages, historical periods, media, and genres. Um, and we were also eager to exhibit uh, a range of disciplinary and interdisciplinary approaches to the material. Um, and this is reflective, we believe, of the Mahabharata's truly remarkable reach across the field of South Asian studies. Our volume begins, as many Mahabharatas do, with a frame story. And the academic frame story of many Mahabharatas is, of course, the book Many Ramayanas, um, which was published in 1991. And this is the visionary volume on the diversity of the Ramayana narrative tradition that was edited by Paula Richman, who is the William H. Danforth Professor of South Asian Religions Emerita at Oberlin College. And we were really honored when Paula agreed to write a foreword to this volume that clearly pays tribute to hers. And Paula ended up writing much more than a foreword. Her piece is really a chapter in its own right. She walks us through a truly remarkable modern Mahabharata, a play called, Fright, called Flight from the Mahabharat, which was written in 1992 by the South African playwright Mutal Naidu. And this play uses an almost all women cast of characters from the Mahabharata to explore the relationship between genre and gender. Um, and after the foreword, we divided the book into four parts. So um, the first part we called the manyness of the Sanskrit Mahabharata. It's only about the Sanskrit Mahabharata, but it's about how that itself is multiple. Um, and so taken together, the chapters in this like first quarter of the volume argue that themes of multiplicity and retelling emerge from and indeed define the Sanskrit Mahabharata itself. Um, it's important to point out that while we speak of the Sanskrit epic Mahabharata, something that we say not only for convenience, but also to honor the aesthetic cohesion of the Sanskrit Mahabharata corpus, there are in fact many Sanskrit Mahabharatas, manuscripts, recensions, oral accounts, written versions. Um, the chapters in this section, this first section therefore, are intended to demonstrate that even when we speak of the Sanskrit Mahabharata, we're actually invoking something defiantly multiplex. So in his chapter, Agarapat, Murderous Rage and Collective Punishment as Thematic Elements in Vyasa's Mahabharata, 
Bob Goldman, who is the William and Catherine Magistretti Distinguished Professor Emeritus of Sanskrit at UC Berkeley, so he's alma mater, um, analyzes two of the most prominent motifs in the epic's narrative framework, revenge and attempted genocide. And in tracing attempted, um, attempted genocides as they repeat throughout the epic, Bob lays out an important starting point for the literature of the Mahabharata at large, namely that extreme violence is never a one-off thing but rather one of those cycles that the Mahabharata can't let go of. Other Mahabharatas will come to confront this centrally positioned theme in their own ways. The next chapter, The Invention of Iravan by David Gittimer, who is the Associate Professor of Religious Studies at DePaul University, um, shows how the rich narrative soil of the Sanskrit Mahabharata allows for the invention of new characters right there within the body of the text. Here, of course, the, the character in question is Ida Avan, the son of Arjuna, and his serpentine lover, Lupi. And capping off this section is a chapter called Bodies That Don't Matter, Gender, Body, and Discourse in the Narrative of Sulabha um, by Sally Sutherland Goldman, who's the senior lecturer in Sanskrit Emerita at UC Berkeley. In addition to her own close reading of the story of Sulabha in the Sanskrit epic, which is remarkable in its own right, um, Sally does two really important things in this chapter. She engages with Nila Kanta's commentary on the Mahabharata, which is one of the epic's most important multiples, this sort of commentary itself. And she shows how gender criticism, far from being something that we modern readers bring to the Mahabharata, is in its own way right there in the epic itself to begin with. Um, the next section of the volume Sanskrit Mahabharatas in poetry and performance expands our depth. So now we're in the second sort of part two of the of the whole volume, second quarter. Um, this this section expands our definition of Sanskrit Mahabharata well beyond um, the early epic poem itself. And this is a necessary task since the characters and stories of the Mahabharata virtually saturate the fabric of Sanskrit literature, which, as we'll soon see, is a far reaching category in its own right. Um, I will not say too much about my own essay, except that it's about um, the figure of Arjuna um, slash Brahanala as he or she appears in the Sanskrit play Pancharatra, which we talked about earlier. Um, but I will note that this chapter is the first of four in the volume th that discuss retellings of that fourth book of the epic, the Vidakta Parvan that I mentioned before. Um, and this is the part of the epic when the Pandavas and Draupadi are living in disguise for a year. Um, I am of course dying to talk about why this particular part of the epic is so popular, but I will restrain myself for the moment. I make no promises about the Q&A. Um, okay, next chapter. The next chapter is about an equally important and multivalent figure, Krishna, um, and an entirely different literary genre, the Mahakavya. In The Lord of Glory and the Lord of Men, Power and Partiality in Magha's Shishupala Vadha, Lawrence McRae, who's a professor in the Departments of Asian Studies and Classics at Cornell University, teaches us about the masterful ways in which the seventh century poet Magha orchestrates an emotionally intense relationship between Krishna and Yudhishthira, a relationship that contributes to Magha's aestheticized vision of rulership and adds further complications to the ever paradoxical figure of Krishna, who is the poem's hero. Next, we have a wonderful study of the Mahabharata as it is brought to life in the Kudiyattam theater tradition of Kerala. In her chapter, What are the Goals of Life? The Vidushaka's interpretation of the Purusharthas in Kulashekara's Subhatra Dhananjaya, Sudhago Palakrishnan, who is a scholar of Indian literature and performing arts and who is the executive director of Sahapedia.org, based in Delhi, um, shows how in the Kudiyattam performance of the Sanskrit drama uh, Subhadra Dhananjaya, the figure of the Vidushaka, or the hero king's comic sidekick, completely upends anything we think we might know about the Purusharthas. In place of dharma, artha, kama, and moksha, we have entertainment, quarreling, cheating, sycophancy, and feasting. And it's a testament to the tensile strength of the world of the Mahabharata in ideology as well as language, um, since much of the Vidushaka's performance unfolds not in Sanskrit, but in Malayalam. And finally, Amanda Kulp, who is the adjunct professor of drama at Vassar College, showcases the staying power of, the Mahabharata, of Mahabharata literature in Sanskrit by analyzing three contemporary productions of Abhinyana Shakuntala. So in How Do We Remember Shakuntala, the Mahabharata and Kalidasa's drama on the contemporary Indian stage, 
Amanda shows how three modern day productions of Shakuntala look to the Sanskrit Mahabharata's portrayal of the Shakuntala character as an important feminist corrective to Kalidasa's version of the heroine. Again, we see the lasting importance of the epic's way of framing the world, a capaciousness even Kalidasa failed to attain. Um, so now we move on to the third part um, of many Mahabharatas, which is entitled um, Regional and Vernacular Mahabharatas from Pre-Modern South Asia. Um, and this section of the book is dedicated to Mahabharatas that were composed between 800 and 1800 CE in languages other than Sanskrit. Sorry. <laughs> um, what? <laughs> yes. Um, and I just can't... Um, overemphasize enough just how many um, retellings of the Mahabharata there are in different languages. You know, um, again, thinking of A.K. Ramunajan, um, he had a quote that no Hindu ever reads the Mahabharata for the first time. Um, and when he does, it isn't usually in Sanskrit. So we kick off this section of the book with Timothy Lorndale's chapter, An Old Dharma in a New Age, Duryodhana and the Reframing of Epic Ethics in Rana's Sahasabhima Vijaya. Um, Tim just defended his PhD dissertation in the Department of South Asia Studies at um, the University of Pennsylvania. And Tim's essay investigates one of the oldest regional Mahabharata poems, Rana's 10th century Kannada, Sahasabhima Vijaya. This text has generally been understood as a retelling centered around the strongest Pandava hero, Bhima. But Tim contends that the Sahasabhima Vijaya actually retells the Mahabharata from the perspective of Duryodhana, the epic supposed anti-hero. Through a close reading of Duryodhana's extended critique of the Pandavas, Tim shows that in Rana's poem, Duryodhana's revisionist interpretation of the Mahabharata opposes the normative pro-Pandava account of the epic story by pronouncing Duryodhana's moral code as the proper conduct for kshatriyas or warriors. Our next chapter is Three Poets, Two Languages, One Translation, The Evolution of the Telugu Mahabharatamu by Harshita Murthinti Kamath, who is Associate Professor of Telugu Culture, Literature, and History at Emory University. The subject of this essay is the Mahabharatamu, which was begun by Naniya, who we've seen in the 11th century, continued by Tekana around the 13th century, and completed by Erena roughly another century later. Harshita traces the evolution of the dynamic relationship between Telugu and, sound, and Sanskrit soundscapes, prosody, characterization, and style in this text. Through a careful examination of different sections of the poem by each of its three composers, Harshita reveals the immense complexities of the process of vernacularization in this Telugu retelling. The following chapter, The Fate of Kichika in Two Jane Apapramsha Mahabharatas, is by Eva de Klerk and Simone Winont, who are both at Ghent University in Belgium. Eva is Associate Professor of Indian Language and Culture, and Simone is a PhD candidate. They present us with a comparison of Svayambhudeva's 9th or 10th century Rita Nemi Chairu and Rai Du's 15th century Harivamsa Purana. While these works were composed several centuries apart in the trans-regional languages of Apabramsha, there's evidence that both the Rita Nemi Chairu and the Harivamsa Purana were read in 15th century Jain literary circles in Gwalior in present-day Madhya Pradesh. By comparing each of these Apabramsha poems depictions of Kichika, who is Virata's brother-in-law who attempts to rape Draupadi during the Pandava's 13th year of exile, Eva and Simon highlight the remarkable diversity of Jain Mahabharatas. Next, we have The Power Politics of Desire and Revenge, a classical Hindi Kichikavada performance at the Tomar Court of Gwalior by Heidi Powells, who is professor in the Department of Asian Languages and Literature at the University of Washington in Seattle. Heidi complicates our studies of Mahabharata's again in 15th century Gwalior by bringing into focus the oldest extant Hindi retelling of the epic, Vishnu Das's Band of Charit. Like Eva and Simon, Heidi focuses on the portrayal of Kichika and his gruesome murder by Bhima. Drawing on methods from microhistory as well as performance studies, Heidi's examination of the Pandav chart interrogates the relationship between emotion and literary performance at the historical moment in which the vernacular, um, this old Hindi Pasha, right, emerged as a mode of literary expression in Gwalior. 
Uh, in the final chapter of this section, Blessed Beginnings, Invoking Vishnu, Krishna, and Rama in two regional Mahabharatas, I compare Viliputra's 15th century Tamil Bharatam and Sabal Singh Chauhan's 17th century Bhasha or Old Hindi Mahabharat. Although these texts were composed in two different regional languages that are distinct in terms of their linguistic, geographic, and literary trajectories, these Mahabharatas share a striking feature. Both poems describe themselves as the charita, or deeds, of the Hindu deity, Krishna. In my essay, I argue that one of the most effective methods that both Vili and Johan use to recast the Mahabharata as a Krishna charita, or the deeds of Krishna, is the insertion of elaborate invocations to various forms of the god in the beginnings of different sections of the respective compositions. So that is part three of many Mahabharatas. And then we arrive at the final and fourth section, um, Mahabharatas of modern South Asia. And this final section of many Mahabharatas examines the spectacularly diverse ways in which the Mahabharata and the idea of the Mahabharata have inspired South Asian literary, religious, artistic, and political thought from the late 19th century up until the 21st. So here, we begin with how to be political without being polemical. The debate between Bomkin Chandra Chattopadhyay and Rubindranath Thakur Tagore over the Krishna Charita, uh, which is by Ahona Panda, assistant professor of history at Claremont McKenna College. Ahona analyzes two very different accounts of Krishna's role in the Sanskrit Mahabharata that were articulated by two seminal Bengali authors and political thinkers. In 1886, when Bonkim was actively engaged in fostering the cause of Hindu nationalism, he wrote the Krishna Charita, which presents Krishna as a historical figure and the embodiment of the perfect king and householder. Ahona provides a close reading of Tagore's harsh 1980, uh, 1896 review of the Krishna Charita and asserts that in contradistinction to Bonkim, Tagore believes that the Mahabharata is politically relevant, not because it is historical, but because of its value as literature that explores the concept of flawed heroism. The next chapter, the epic and the novel, Buddha Dev Bose's modern reading of the Mahabharata, is by Shudipto Kobiraj, a professor of Indian politics and intellectual history at Columbia University. Shudipto turns to a more contemporary Bengali literary engagement with the Sanskrit Mahabharata, Buddha Dev Bose's um, 1974 prose study of the epic. Using Mikhail Bakhtin's 1941 essay, Epic and Novel, as a point of entrance, Shudipto shows that Bose detects certain aspects in the Mahabharata, such as its distorted aesthetic vision and its presentation of Yudhishthira as a valuable human being that suit the sensibility of a more modern reader. Ultimately, Shudutto argues that Bose's reading of the epic articulates a modern coming-of-age story through Yudhishthira. Then we have the chapter Draupadi Yajnaseni Panchali Krishna, representations of an epic heroine in three novels by Pamela Lotspeech, who is Associate Professor of South Asian Studies at UNC Chapel Hill. Pam traces post-colonial literary representations of Draupadi in three novels, all by women authors. So we have Joy Tirmai Devi's Bengali Epar Ganga Opar Ganga, um, Pratibha Rai's Oriya Yajnasini, and Chitta Banerjee Devakorni's English, The Palace of Illusions. Indebted to and invigorated by theoretical work on global feminisms, Pam's chapter demonstrates how in the last 50 years, Draupadi has become a multivalent figure in modern Indian literature. The penultimate chapter, From Excluded to Exceptional, cast in contemporary Mahabharatas, is by Sucheta Kanjilal, assistant teaching professor of English and writing at the University of Tampa. Sucheta draws our focus to modern representations of lower caste and Adivasi characters, right? Sucheta considers two Bengali short stories by Mahasetha Devi and Kiran Nagarkar's English play, Bedtime Story, as she investigates what happens to marginalized Mahabharata figures like Eklavia in modern times. She demonstrates just how complicated it is to represent social marginalities in contemporary India within the Mahabharata context. And she also reveals that these works by Devi and Nagarkar, who themselves come from upper caste backgrounds, at times reflect the very oppressive structures that they're working to overturn with these Mahabharatas. 
finally, the book's 18th, a very auspicious Mahabharata number, and final chapter, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, the Mahabharata as dystopian future, is by Philip Leckendorf, Professor Emeritus of Hindi and Modern Indian Studies at the University of Iowa. Philip examines a trilogy of graphic novels titled The Core of the Empire, Philip shows how the Korva Empire adapts the international visual code of the science fiction graphic novel in order to texturize the Mahabharata's tale of fratricidal conflict. He finds that the trilogy draws upon another trilogy, the original Star Wars, uh, Star Wars movie trilogy, so A New Hope, The Empire Strikes Back, and Return of the Jedi, uh, so as to create a Mahabharata that will be simultaneously archaic and dystopian. In doing so, Philip brings the Mahabharata into the intimately well-known world of many readers of the book, or rather suggests how it has been there all along. If, as Ramanujan writes of the Sanskrit Mahabharata, one thing is certain, total destruction, then it is just as certain that retelling the Mahabharata, continuing the story, leaving it unfinished, is a way of counteracting that destructive bent. When we recycle the Mahabharata, whether we do so artistically, as many of the works we study in this book do, or scholastically, as the book itself does, <laughs> we insist that the whole story has not yet been told. In this way, our various retellings allow us to do our part in forestalling the Mahabharata's famous curse. Each return to the story responds to the Mahabharata's ethos of disintegration and decay with the equally powerful force of creativity. So long as we continue to make something new of the Mahabharata, we stay safe. When we keep the Mahabharata alive, the Mahabharata keeps us alive. This is part of the epic's mysterious power. It's tempting to think, indeed, that the kaleidoscopic Mahabharata tradition occupies its own kind of cycle of rebirth. Each telling gives the Mahabharata a new body, a new life. Desire, always wanting these stories, keeps the cycle in motion. And this, of course, is what we call samsara. When it comes to the lives of humans and other creatures, various South Asian religious traditions speak of samsara as something to be escaped or transcended. But when it comes to stories, and particularly when it comes to the Mahabharata, we seem to find an altogether different paradigm. The Mahabharata cycle of narrative rebirth is not one from which any of us seem to want to be free. Frightening it may be, and complex and bewildering as well. But is it a samsara from which we hope to be released? What the Mahabharata tells is by large gruesome and deeply difficult. And yet in order to find in this story something more, something different, we must enter its stream for we know it is our own and not let go. And so, like all accounts of the Mahabharatas, ours in this book is by necessity an unfinished one. We must keep our Ganeshas wanting more. Ramanujan once said that no, no Hindu, or perhaps no person belonging to South Asia, ever reads the Mahabharata or the Ramayana in another version of the story for the first time. Let us propose a codicil. No one ever reads the Mahabharata for the last time. Thank you. I would like you to talk a bit more about how you are deploying this category of South Asian. And I understand Mahabharata is, you know, in, in Sindhi or Urdu, but, you know, for many of us, especially those of us who are Dalits, uh, you know, Mahabharata has remained primarily a site of genocide for us. Um, and so I was wondering, what does it mean um, you know, for, for an audience that is not from your caste background, your religious background, to say that you love Mahabharata and that you want to, you know, what is, what, what, what is this, this quest to rescue something? What is, what is the place of caste, for example, in this? And I'm not, I know, understand that there is this one chapter on caste that looks critically at caste um, and, and the casteist, um, you know, the, the Brahminical text that Mahabharata is. Let me maybe begin with the last point that you made about um, the role of the Mahabharata in, um, and the sort of the role of not even the Mahabharata itself, but the idea of the Mahabharata in justifying or contributing to um, caste and religious-based genocide um, in like the modern period. And 
I think one of the, like as a Sanskritist, I'm just speaking for myself, but also for the, um, for the book itself, which does like, as, as, as we explained, it does focus so much on what does it mean to be a Sanskrit Mahabharata? Um, I believe that in sort of in common understandings, um, that are of the Mahabharata that are invoked, um, to justify this ex extreme, horrible, just unconscionable violence um, of all kinds. But yeah, as you're saying, especially caste-based. Um, the idea of the Mahabharata that is invoked is I believe inaccurate to what is actually in the Sanskrit text. And it is inaccurate to what the broader idea of a Sanskrit Mahabharata is. And so one of the main um, goals of our book is to respond to, um, you know, if someone were to come along and say, well, the Mahabharata says this, and actually the Mahabharata says that violence is good. And if you look at the Sanskrit Mahabharata, it's a, and you know, and we uh, like the whole point of our book is just to say, no, <laughs> um, actually it's much more complicated than that actually the sanskrit mahabharata is much more critical i think if there's a strong like anti anti violence anti like honestly anti caste discrimination side of the mahabharata if you really look and if you actually read um and and so a lot of i think there's actually some real value there in actually taking seriously and reading very closely what the Sanskrit Mahabharata and what other Mahabharatas in Sanskrit and what other Hindu Mahabharatas actually say, um, because they are so frequently invoked, I think, in a, in a really like intellectually dishonest way. Um, and I think it's important for scholars like us to come along and and hopefully add some important political nuance to that conversation. We're very aware of these um, identities we hold and um, the responsibilities it is to make sure um, that marginalized voices are heard. Um, and this is actually something that was really important for us, um, collaborating with um, our wonderful author, Sucheta Kanjilal, um, to make sure that we talked about, at least in some form, um, how Dalits um, in South Asia today are using the Mahabharata in different ways. And so, um, you know, just in the final, um, you know, few pages of Sucheta's essay, we, we talk about this figure of Eklavya who's brought up so many times as this, you know, heroic figure who gives up his thumb and he's such a good student and he's so great, but it's this horrific violence that is being imparted on this Adivasi Dalit character, right? To cut off his thumb and give away his entire livelihood. Um, so, you know, in Om Prakash Valmiki's um, seminal Hindi autobiography, Chutan, right? Leftovers, um, he illuminates the modern difficulties of Dalit life. I'm just reading from Sucheta's essay here by conversing with the epic imaginary. And so Om Prakash Valmiki recalls um, from his own childhood, right? Asking an upper caste teacher why his community's lives are not documented in the Mahabharata. And he points out that the teacher romanticizes Drona, right? The teacher of the Pandavas and the Kauravas who forces Eklavya to cut off his thumb. Um, he romanticizes his poverty while ignoring similar problems that Dalit people face. So my initiation in the Mahabharat world started uh, through the Bia Chopra Mahabharat. Uh, which of course was the one that I watched because I was, you know, growing up in India at that time. And so I'm constantly comparing and contrasting. That's also because I'm a comparatist by um, training. And so, you know, one of the things that really struck me about that Mahabharata, the Beer Chopra Mahabharata was the emphasis on Draupadi's kesh or hair. Mm. Uh, and uh, this constant invocation throughout that Mahabharata that, you know, she is going to keep her hair uh, she's not going to tie it. And then, you know, Bhim and others are going to, Bhim specifically is going to bring the lahu or the blood of, from Dushasan's, you know, chati and all that. But I am kind of, you know, missing all that entertainment <laughs> in the original <laughs> Mahabharata. It doesn't specifically, it doesn't highlight Draupadi's hair. And so I am wondering, and in fact, I'm missing a lot of Draupadi's um, voice maybe I am at that section where she's not talking but you know I'm just there where people are talking about peace and Vidur is giving his uh, Vidur Niti and all of that so yeah. I was wondering 
if you could give me a spoilers alert, alert or just let me know do is the original mahabharat going to talk about draupadi's hair at all or is it just an invention by b r chopra to entertain entertain the <laughs> public i don't believe draupadi's hair is in either the vulgate or the southern recension or the critical edition so the Thanks yeah that that place, well that particular vow yeah that so yeah, let, so the like, Sorry, we're both like <laughs> you asked the right people. Through, yeah. You asked the right people. We're obsessed with this stuff. Okay, so the the vow itself is, to my understanding, not in um any recension. Not in Sanskrit. not in the Sanskrit Sanskrit like official. However, however, the subsequent Mahabharatas that integrated that vow um or like invented it or like put it in there did so for a reason and that is that at least in my in my reading of the um of the Sanskrit Mahabharata which I will say is like largely around the critical edition that was made at the Pandarkar um institute um Draupadi's hair is still very much a theme and the this like visual sort of like almost cinematic lingering on her hair in book two in the game of dice scene. And then again in book four with um, Kichika, um, it's like that focus on her hair is is absolutely like a, a very, very powerful force. And um, she's definitely pulled by her hair into oh, for the sure. dice game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah, for sure, for sure. And it's like, it's like this hair that had just been like sprinkled with the water from Yudhishthira's Abhisheka. I mean, it's, it's very, very like elaborate. Um, and yeah, absolutely. I mean, the hair was, um, and the person who's written a ton about this is a guy named Alf Hiltabeitel. Um, he has an article called Draupadi's Hair. Draupadi's Hair, hair literally. Um, so if yeah. you want to read that, it's a great article. Yeah, I have a PDF uh, of it if you want. Uh, send me an email. I'll send yeah, it. but absolutely. Like this, the, the hair as the symbol of um, sort of all kinds of virtue and sort of moral standing yeah. is for women is is huge. And and the fact that, you know, her hair is is loose because yeah. she is menstruating, she's relaxing. Or just in the one grade. You know, in a one grade, exactly. Yeah. Whether one grade or not. Um, in in the Veni Samhara, we get some indication of yeah. the vow. This isn't, yeah, yeah, this isn't or like a first century or sorry, Seven, first first millennium yeah, play Sanskrit, about, um, about this vow. About this vow, um, but it is huge in regional retellings. Yeah. Um, in Vili Samalbarth, and one of the two Mahabharatas I work closely with, it's just a huge part of the story. And then, you know, um, that is Dushasana, whose blood uh, Draupadi has to wash it in, is very important. It's very important in all of the um, folk performances of the Mahabharata. We see actually on um, the cover of many Mahabharata, we have this beautiful um, painting um, in the Chitrakati um, style. style of um, kind of storytelling as well as painting. And you can see that there are many Draupadis on our cover that goes well with our theme of many Mahabharatas. And you can see that the second Draupadi here, that her hair is loose here, right? Yeah. That she's where she's making the vow. Um, so we, we might not find the vow in the Sanskrit Mahabharata itself, but we see it, I think, as yeah. early as the seventh century. Yeah, and, yeah. It's like, and, it comes and, in like early in the Mahabharata tradition know, in Sanskrit. There's so many parts of the Mahab larger Mahabharata tradition that when I learned they weren't in the Sanskrit Mahabharata, my mind was blown. For example, Draupadi's prayer to Krishna in the disrobing scene, not in the critical edition of the Sanskrit Mahabharata. Um, the scene where Krishna um, blocks the sun yeah. so that um, Jayadratha can't tell if it's sunrise or sundown, not in the Sanskrit Mahabharata, or at least not in the critical edition. Um, Durvasa, when he comes super hungry to see the Pandavas in the forest and Draupadi has his magic vest vessel um and oh. she's out of food and Krishna, yeah no this Krishna totally goes yeah, into yeah, yeah. Finds one right that's in some recension of the Sanskrit Mahabharata but not in the critical edition and it's just so interesting to see these stories are so ingrained in so many different retellings of the Mahabharata across South Asia um and and that people are like of course it's in the Mahabharata what are you talking about and it is and, and right, it is, it is, it is. It is. And that's exactly. the point of this book right and then so when people say but it's not in the original and the OG but also but again like what do you mean by the original exactly, just because exactly. it isn't in the critical edition doesn't mean it was and present in the tradition in yeah. Sanskrit early on, yes. right? Yes. Um, so <laughs> my introduction to Mahabharata was uh, through this book by Devdat Patnayak. So, you know, in that he writes from a diff very different perspective about all the characters. And he's written from, you know, the Korvar's perspective and sort of showing them as the protagonists. And he literally, like, their names are not even Duryodhan and so on. It's actually Suyodhan. And like, that's, I found that very interesting. And Krishna is sort of portrayed as this like really morally corrupt 
person <laughs> and like you, you know it's just very interesting to read so I just wanted to know if if like your book addresses that sort of because one of you mentioned that Krishna's paradoxical nature or something like that so does your book sort of touch on that a little bit I would I would be interested to know that um yeah a lot a lot of chapters in the book both the ones like in the early sections that are about the Sanskrit Mahabharata itself and also like early Sanskrit Mahabharata is plural way right up until the end um talk about basically the sort of the idea of this of the Mahabharata story being sort of multi-sympathetic um that 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 one of the real virtues of the story itself and so many of the ways in which it's been retold is that um is that it really gives readers listeners audiences um the ability to embody and see things from a number of different perspectives including ones that are quite surprising <laughs> right um so even you know the sanskrit mahabharata itself like in one in one breath will talk about how um just how sort of let's to, to use krishna for example to talk about how you know amazing honorable respected krishna is how valuable he is what a deep friend he is to arjuna and so on um and then in like you know in the next, next breath it, in the next breath he'll be trying and failing to comfort Arjuna after after the death of Abhimanyu or trying and failing to comfort Subhadra and you know or, he's or like of being cursed or Gan or Gandhati is coming along and saying like how did you let all of this happen I mean that's a classic response like often when I read the Mahabharata with my students they'll say like how could Krishna have let this happen and the amazing thing is that that question is right there in the Sanskrit Mahabharata itself, um, where where Gandhari like asks asks precisely that: How could you have you had all this power? How could you have stood by and let this happen? Right. So, um, and Duryodhana, of course, is the classic example of. Um, uh, I mean, he uses both the names Duryodhana and Suryodhana in the, in, Sanskrit. In the Sanskrit, and further, like, I mean, just Sanskrit wise, like they are both compliments. Um, it just depends on sort of how you read the Sanskrit, but, um, but yeah, Duryodhana is the classic example of someone whom the Sanskrit Mahabharata and many other Mahabharatas treat with a lot of sympathy. Uh, it was an amazing presentation and thank you so much, Dr. Sohini and Nell for, uh, for taking out some time and presenting uh, your book and telling us how important it is to you know, learn about different, uh, how, how important it is to explore Mahabharata in different perspectives from different lenses and see there is so much to learn, so much to, you know, how we can tell and retell this Mahabharata in so many ways. So uh, thank you so much. And I love the kind of interactive session you have kept throughout, uh, <laughs> throughout the sessions, like, you know, trying to juggle from one to another and, and again, it's really important for us to talk to audiences in India. Yeah. And, you know, the, the first yeah. question we got was just so important. Yeah, I'm exactly. really thankful for that question yeah, and for exactly. all the questions we've had today. And yeah. Just, thank you so much.